start. Where'd you go? Yes, so I'm going to start and uh, welcome you to the second collective chat format for the Women's Kiteboarding Collective. Um, this is a new format that we started this year. Um, this is our board. I think most of you know who we are. Um, please consider volunteering if you haven't yet to help our mission in supporting women kiters from around the globe. Um, you've already hopefully renamed yourself on where you're calling in from today. Again, thanks for joining us wherever you are. We really appreciate the time with you. Um, again, this is our new monthly format to connect with you, other women kiters from around the globe to support, inspire, and just network and communicate with each other, get to know each other so we can have more kiting friends around the globe. Um, and as you know, we have kiting experts every month now to inspire us. Um, and this is part of our new format, 15 to 20 minutes with our guest speaker. And the rest of our hour is spent with just networking and visiting uh, about kiting. Someday we'll get back to some in-person events, we hope, where we can meet up with you on the beach. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. You may have heard, and I'm sure you have, of Lightwave Kiteboards, which is this really cool line of kiteboards that are quite unique. And when Dave Turner, also known as Lightwave Dave, um, designed these boards some 26 years ago, Dave, uh, um, 24, I think now. 24 years ago, um, he was looking for a way to design a board that was lightweight and thin, which would give us excellent results, but at a lower price point. So it could be a value buy for a majority of people. And so he got into designing his own kite boards um, before he was even really a kiter. Um, he was just looking for a better product. Um, and he was a windsurfer uh, before a kiter. And then some other things about um, Dave that you'll want to know. Um, he was not only a kiter and a windsurfer, but he was also a very proficient skier, snowboarder, um, and kayaker. And as a matter of fact, an interesting point about a fun fact about Dave is that he raced in the, uh, for the U.S. in the World Cup and World Championships in whitewater kayaking. And there's a picture of him over there on the right. You'll see. Look at those muscles. That was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you were really killing it out there on the white water. Um, and some other fun facts about him just uh, personally is that he makes his own wine um, near Sacramento, California, where he lives, mm -hmm. and he collects NG cars. So he's uh, quite the Renaissance man. He does a lot of really cool things. Thanks, Polly. Of course. And so without uh, prolonging the introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Dave, who's going to talk with us briefly today about perseverance in business and kiting, and specifically three traits that he found to make him successful in both areas of life. So Dave, All right. Thanks, take it Holly. over. Well, that was quite an introduction. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I've, I've really been blessed to be able to have this job and to get into kiting when I did uh, about 98 is when I got into it and I, I was able to take skills that I learned from from building other fiberglass objects like I uh, Sue is your husband David K he's really good at that sort of thing but... <laughs> he's actually he's actually here because I mentioned that uh, Dave's going to be talking to the girl so he's like can i sit in yeah <laughs> so i learned actually from like a father figure he wasn't actually my father but he was a aerospace engineer for a composites for lockheed martin and we built a better kayak back in the kayak racing uh, phase of my life but i was able to move that technology from sport to sport really into windsurf building and then kiteboard building and a uh, kind of funny story, when I was getting into it, there was a couple of companies before me, but not very many. Um, my mentor is Jimmy Lewis, and he taught me a lot about building a smaller board. You know, the commercial boards you could get at that time were only like surfboard construction, you know, a couple of inches thick and uh, not like you see today. So I was trying to get into a factory by the first year of building boards. Um, I was already building like 200 boards in the first year in my garage, it was getting out of hand. So I was trying to get into a factory, but the, the big factories like in Thailand, 
that built the thick boards of the time wouldn't have me. So I persevered and uh, was tenacious there and found a local factory here in California that built snowboards. And so they didn't know what a kite board was. I didn't know how snowboards were built, but we sort of melded our knowledge and uh, came up with what I believe is the first commercially produced thin kite board, like they all are today, pretty much. Of course, thin back then was like a half an inch thick, you know. Nowadays, they're a little bit thinner, but uh, that was a long time ago. But anyway, so um, being tenacious and all that in my not taking no for an answer and the, the sourcing factories and all is is, is a uh, very good quality that you can carry over into kiteboarding because you know a lot of times you don't want to take no for an answer on uh, kiteboarding either oh it's too windy well you know or it's not windy enough well i think i could try it you know but you, you have to be tenacious at both so um i've been really lucky as most of you guys are more traveled than me now though i've gotten to, to go to europe and in asia and and both on the kiteboarding end and on the manufacturing end um, and develop a lot of relationships. That's really important too in running my business. Of course, it's, you know, who you know, it's uh, relationships are super important um, from manufacturing to your dealers to just meeting people on the beach and getting ideas. Um, I try to really listen to the regular person on the beach. You know, I get tons of advice from people. What? <laughs> what I should do and shouldn't do with my business. You have to listen to the right thing, but it's always good to get feedback from my end user. I like that. And um, so, yeah, I've been unfortunate to, to be able to expand my business over the years. And actually, I have a little bit different model than some people, than most companies. I think I, I run everything by myself. So it's, uh, I do about a thousand boards a year, roughly. But uh, it's kind of nice, I think, to have a smaller company and not be way in debt. So that's just my personal thing. But um, I, I'm able to compete with bigger companies pretty well, I think. So um, I, have, I have a little bit different philosophy, though, than, than some of them. Um, like, team riders are important, I think. but. Um, it's it's really expensive to have a full on team that you send around the world and and uh, tons of magazine advertising and all that. So I kind of rely more on the local beach ambassador approach with a couple of usually like one woman and one man uh, photogenic capable team rider that I can do photo shoots with and stuff. So right now I'm down to um, Setlana. Uh, Carol in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She's my um, team rider at the moment. And well, it has been for about five years. And unfortunately, my male team rider, he, he quit kiteboarding. He got burned out and his knees blew out. Rocky Chatwell, maybe some of you guys know him. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, he quit kiting. D Dave, we're so happy to know that you have a woman team rider for your brand. Yeah. That's super cool. And they're going to be uh, capable. It's not just another pretty face. You know, right. They have capable. to be good. So that's really good. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and you mentioned yesterday they have to be a good person, too, to represent your brand. Because as, well, a, yeah. as a one man show, which you are, um, you are literally the face of your business. And we talked a little bit about this yesterday on our call together that, you know, you really do everything. Um, you keep you keep the business pretty close to yourself, so you want people representing you that really do a good job of you know showing your face of the business, right? That um, you're you're a high integrity business. Design yeah, the collections. Design the collections, right? And marketing, Park as you Lump mentioned. Shorman, yeah, and you know, interesting what you told me about yesterday was um, uh, you know we were talking about perseverance in business and in your business, and how did you you know I was saying like how do you last as a as a smaller kiteboard company with all the big guys out there? you know, for Not over easy. you know 24 years. 
And we kind of wrapped it up in three things. And you said it was, you know, relationships, which you mentioned, right? Like relationships yeah. were so important. Um, but also, and, and we all know that in business is really key. Um, it's not always what you know, but who you know. But you also mentioned something about flexibility. Can you talk to us a little bit about the flexibility, what you had to do to, to get your manufacturers in different places, different countries for different parts of your board? Like, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, um, well, uh, you, you can't be scared. You just got to go around the world by yourself, go to a foreign country, uh, go to uh, Thailand, China. Taiwan is where my manufacturing is right now. I tried to keep it in the U.S., but I couldn't. Um, and you mentioned, if I may just interject, you mentioned that when you started, that a lot of the other companies were not telling you. They weren't giving up their manufacturer uh, names that's overseas. Correct. That's correct. And that correct. really was a stumbling um, block. People are tight, tight uh, lipped often about their manufacturing connections. So I've, you know, it, you got to really delve into it and make some calls. And I've gone over to other industries like wakeboarding and learn where the wakeboards were made or um, trade shows. Surf Expo in Florida is where I got a lot of my connections. That's a big meeting place um, from worldwide, you know, industry people. Um, so being, uh, you mentioned being flexible. Yeah. On that note, you have to pretty much work all hours around the clock when you're running an international business by yourself. You know, often, you know, I'll get up at two in the morning and have a three hour meeting with uh, the graphics people in Taiwan or something like that, you know. So you have to definitely be flexible on your work schedule and just your time, you know, different things are pulling at, you know. Orders usually come first. I get the orders packed out same day and ship, but then I'll have to work late at night doing website development or something like that. So yeah, wow. if, if you want to make a business, I think you got to really, you know, be flexible on your time. And, mm -hmm. and, and in kiting too, you have to be flexible. If it's not exactly the wind you thought or it's too cold, sometimes you got to suck it up and just like uh, take all your gear every time and try to ride with you, you know? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, and gear matters, right? And, and talking about being resourceful in your business, um, you know, having to go to all these different countries and track down manufacturers and, and just to make all the different elements of your board. You were talking about the bindings versus the board, right? All these different yeah. elements that you had to use three different, factories, different manufacturers, yeah. factories in different parts of the world. Talk exactly. about being resourceful. I mean, you pulled it all together. Um, and then tell us a little bit about how being resourceful as a kiter, what that looks like. Um, um, as a kiter being yeah. resourceful well you need the right gear you know you gotta you gotta be covered like i mean nowadays people have their foil maybe for the ultra light wind or if uh, i mean my light wind board the wing is is really popular this one over here it's um maybe for people who don't foil or it's shallow or they're beginners it's their you know first couple of years of kite boarding you can't just jump on a foil and go so that board's really popular for that. Um, I think a lot of people get boards that are too small to start. And then they struggle more, you know, and they couldn't make it easy on themselves, and, you know, get a smaller kite, bigger board. But um, yeah, yeah, talk about that whole, like, you know how we, you know how we, you know, you were talking yesterday about kite size and board and going bigger than you think that we typically- I've always gotten in more trouble small. being underpowered than I have being overpowered. As far as getting washed down wind in some rocks or a place where you have to do the walk of shame, kind of. Of course, you don't want to be, you know, dangerous about it. I'm sure Laurel's cringing as an instructor. <laughs> don't send them out on too big of a kite. No, but you can send them out on a smaller kite when you've got a big plating surface. The thing that makes these work is they flare out on the ends. And when you're riding, you're riding on that corner and ha uh, a regular board would taper in right here and you lose that corner, which lets it sink down in Maui style winds, you know, when it's really windy. But if it's like, you know, light wind and you're trying to plane up, it's, it's really nice to have this design. You can see a thing on my website, I talked about it, it's um, designer notes called, yes, Jill? 
can I just say thank you? Because I am that person. Yep. I had a really, I was, it took me so long to learn to kite. I'm not like a naturally athletic person. I'm just go out and like to cruise around, but I had a really hard time with my water starts, like a long time. And finally somebody handed me one of your boards. Oh, thank you. Oh my God. I was on it forever. Yeah, and, like then, the and then, and then he yeah, listen, thank you. And that's why when I saw that you come up, I'm like, oh my God, I got, thank you so much. It was, I had one of those oh. big boards. Somebody finally said, you know what, let's get you a big board. And it was perfect. So thank you. I am, I am like the perfect person for that. I was the epitome <laughs> right and thank we you, kept Tom. that. It was actually my boyfriend's. And so we kept it kind of in our, in our repertoire for a long time. And just recently, maybe three months ago, he was with somebody who was learning to kite and he had that because we, oh, he was out in Hatteras. We always take it to Hatteras because it's a session saver in light wind. For sure. Yeah. And, um, we sold it to a new, it's kind of, we were, we kind of were really, we, we should hold on to it. We love it. But we sold it to um, somebody who was learning to kite and kind of was in my position. So we've passed it along to the next person that, uh, that, you know, like needs it. So thank you so much for making Thanks. such a great, no, that's a great story. Thank yeah, you. Thank yeah. you. That is a great I, testimony. I really did get that a lot from people that say, oh, yeah, I bought my first bargain closeout board. It's a 200-pound guy, and he bought a 130, you know, centimeter board. Oh, but I got it cheap, you know. I'm just going to start with this. And then they just struggle the whole time, you know. It's true. And I, I know I met Dave through my my husband, um, Rob, who was an advocate of white wave day boards. And when I was a newbie, just like you, Jill, I struggled to get up. I was really struggling, wasn't very athletic. I didn't feel. And um, it, it wasn't until my husband handed me a light wave, uh, a wing from Dave that I yeah. got up immediately. And I, yeah, look at the shape. And well, what makes them kind of different too is for a big board, they have a lot of rocker. You mm -hmm. see the rocker? Right. They have like two inches of rocker, which you would think would make them not go upwind. But the rocker makes it good in chop and for freestyle. And if you have a flat surface, it'll go upwind and plane in perfectly flat conditions. But as soon as it gets choppy and all, it's like a Colombian drug smuggling submarine. It goes, goes below the surface, you <laughs> get water in your face, everything. So with uh, the rocker, it really helps with freestyle chop, but the flare on the corners is what keeps it up wind and planing. That's super cool. And I, I think that Dave, you just came up with this amazing design. And now that I'm an intermediate kiter, you know, we were talking, uh, you know, cause you and Rob, my husband, I always say gear matters. You know, gear matters when you're doing a sport, you know, if you want flexibility and, and availability to do things at different times of, you know, with wind and location and gear matters. And, and so I finally was like, okay, you know, I need to break down and buy a new board, but instead of using my husband's, you know, hand me down. Um, but I remember talking to you about this and saying, I thought the wing was really just a light wind board or just for a new kiter, like Jill and I were talking about just for getting up water starts. But tell me a little bit about now that I'm an intermediate kiter, you were saying that the wing can also be great for freestyle. Yeah, anyway. it's great for freestyle and jumping as long as, you know, if you're getting over 25 miles per hour average wind speed, you know, you're going to want a smaller board. But, yeah. um, you know, under 20, it's great for freestyle and jumping. And all. Joe, my dealer in Kansas City, he goes like 50 feet on his woo all the time on his carbon wing 155. Wow. So the 155 is more like that's the smaller one, believe it or not. That's my size. And right. I remember saying to you, I thought that was too big for a woman or my size. And you're saying, no, 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 no. Most people go too small. Well, it rides like a much smaller board. It's, I, I took, I borrowed some design theory from snowboarding. I snowboard a lot, but pretty close to Tahoe. And it has a side cut like on a snowboard. So it's narrower in the middle and wider on the ends. That's how snowboard is. And it lets it flex more in the middle, but plain off the corners. It's just a cool design that works so well. And then I make regular boards too for higher winds. You know, 135, 139 sizes. And that's the kick S. 
Thank That's you awesome. Guys. That's awesome. Well, you've, you've but, designed a great board. I, I'm just so impressed with what you came up with in this market and that you really do compete against much larger, larger kiteboarding companies. And you've been, been very successful. Be able to, I was blessed to start early in the right time. You know, you did, I started in 98, sure. like there was hardly any kiteboarders around. So, well, I mean, obviously it's a testimony to your perseverance because, yeah. you know, starting a small business and succeeding um beyond your dreams to this point uh, i think it's it's just it's a testament to you and your perseverance and dedication and obviously as a athlete your whole life you know you've used that same perseverance to to succeed once i get um, my head focused on something i really go for it yeah like, no like I, training for the olympics and all I, that yeah stuff. no i know you as a kiter and i know you as a friend and i just i i love your perseverance and you know it's talking about those three elements which were relationships flexibility and resourcefulness that in business, those are three qualities that help us persevere successfully um, and in kiting as well. You know, it's relationships with each other, you know, kiters on the beach that sometimes help us get better. You know, and, and what would you say about that with kiters, kiters that so maybe- friendly. Yeah, Generally, but if they can't just are really keep getting coaches. Yeah, I mean, when a lot of us here are instructors and of course we love to help people uh, and, and maybe get paid for it, you know, but, but sometimes you just don't want to keep paying for a coach. How, how can we be resourceful with our fellow kiters? Um, I mean, on the just beach have a group of ourselves. friends, you know, the, the, the Facebook groups in the local um, areas, you know, always post on there and try to get somebody to go with you. And, you know, it's, it, it's generally pretty easy to make kiter friends, I would yeah. say, you know, and people are pretty helpful. Uh, I think it's, it's nice to like, we have Bay Area kiteboarding from San Francisco uh you know you can always hook up with somebody that's going but at our spot shoot, there's a there's hundred people out there kiting in the hard spots anyway on a busy summer day you know well and i know i always it's try to just out. hook up with someone who's better than me right like i just try to connect and say hey do you want to kite together and i know they're better than me and i know it's going to push me that's and sometimes i'll or even have people kite tail. in front of me yeah, like jump on their tail, a, right. Jump right on their tail, man. That's right. Just start following them. And That's do what, what I do. do. I just follow, and I do that with my husband because he's a way better kiter than me. I'll just follow him and he'll do a trick and I'll try to emulate you that same, the same thing. Trick. You just kind and, of follow just behind follow him. just follow him, shadow idea. him. Yeah, yeah well, I, I, I like that approach. I think I'll use that more. Just don't get in their way. <laughs> just get far <laughs> enough away you don't tangle them up. Yeah, exactly. Hey, you know, Dave, I remember your your what put you on the map was that wing that you were just showing us with that rectangular shape well actually rocker. it was the wake and style first. oh okay it was the that wake was, and style that was the first pressed thin board in the world i think all right well and i think i know you and then the from wing the though wing. is my definitely my most popular board for like the last 10 years now. oh that's your best seller okay so yeah. that wing for for light wind for water starts for some freestyle jumping for more intermediate um right i I would love, I think our audience would also love to hear some light wind tips. Oh, okay. Because your your wing is, is really known for that, right? For light wind. Well, and... you guys are instructors. I'm not an instructor really, but I mean, I'll try to say what I know. Yeah, what uh, do you know? You're very experienced. I'm an experienced. I'm just not a, you know, IK instructor or anything. But I'm like 225 pounds, six foot four, pretty big, you know? And there's a video on my website where it's eight to ten and a half miles per hour, and I'm staying up wind on a wing, and that was a 17 meter kite. But Whoa. it's, um, but I mean, eight to ten and a half that's like eight is barely you can keep your kite in the air. So, like, right if you're really trying to stay up wind in super light winds like that, you gotta keep your lines tight. So, I mean, if I'm going to take off to the left and there, you know, I'm clear of the shore, I body dragged out safely, um, I will down loop the kite in the opposite you know, direction. If I go left, I'll steer right and just dive the kite to the right and loop it on the takeoff. And a common mistake, um, you know, beginners make is they're going to put on the brakes with the board too much. You really want to turn your body so it's facing downwind loop that thing backwards, the kite, take off, and then you're going to take off straight downwind, gradually edge back up into it without killing all your speed, you know. But be, that's like the most aggressive start you can do, really. Uh, I mean, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you know, you can just 
dive it from 12 o'clock to six o'clock, right before it hits the water, turn it up. Sometimes you have to be very aggressive, go for a couple of pumps. And, so, um, so it sounds like, and, and by the way, Dave, and for everyone, I put that link in the chat window. So if you'd like to, as soon as we're done here, go take a look at that video. He's talking about kiting in eight to 10 miles an hour. Um, that's just on my local lake here. That's crazy. It's, no it's, current I, I can't even imagine being able to kite in that. So what you're saying is, of course, the board matters, right? And the, I'm sure the wing really helps. But yeah. the, the, the direction you're pointing the board, so just like when you learn a water start and you point the board downwind, right? Yes, that's is, very is important. To, to get going so you don't carve left upwind too soon and choke off what little wind you had. Um, and then also you mentioned um, the, the looping the kite is super important in light wind to get going. Well, that's that's the most radical way, the most power you can get. Right. You know, if if you're a beginner, intermediate, you probably won't feel too comfortable doing that. You'll just dive it in the same direction. But so often, you'll see people just slowly dive it. You know, you want to really turn that thing straight down at the water. And right. That jerk will get you going, and then you can generate your apparent win, and you know that, that then you can lock in hopefully. I remember learning about a parent wind and IKO mm -hmm. training. <laughs> yeah. Good to know. Yeah, the Thank new you. ones uh, are a little bit lighter and stronger, actually, which sounds like a tagline. But I consulted with my uh, my father figure guy that showed me about composites and on. We use uh, instead of a bi-directional cloth, we're using a unidirectional S glass under the carbon, and all the fibers are just going tip to tail. So that you're getting the strength you need, but not the weight of those other fibers going side to side. And that in, in uh, composite with the other bi-directional carbon gives you the strength and you lose a lot of weight there too. So the new ones are really nice. That makes the, sense. The weight helps a lot too when you're pushing the limits like that, a really light kite and a light board. You know, it's awesome. Helpful. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. So yep. Dave, we have a couple of questions in the, the window here. Sure. Um, looks like Joyce uh, has a question. I don't know if you see it there, but I'll read it. In 20 years, a lot of things have changed, including focus on the environment in production recycling. Um, how are you meeting these demands? Uh, is this something you're looking at in your company at this point? Well, my, uh, my factory builds the boards. Um, I mean, they're a wood core with a, uh, it, it's a polonia wood, which is a pretty fast growing tree. And so that's a sustainable core material. Nice. Um, the old ones used to be a foam core, which is not as sustainable for sure. Good. Um, I mean, they're still using epoxy resin and stuff. I don't know how you get around that. And yeah, and Jennifer is asking, do you see materials or manufacturing changes in the near future? What kind of things are you seeing on the horizon? Well, I know Cabrina uses some pretty cool stuff that, uh, what is it, uh, Francis, that rock core uh, cloth? There's some kind of cloth. Oh, on that um, note, she left. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where she went. Maybe she went to go get a, a, a sample. A sample. <laughs> right? I mean... Yeah. So they say it's basalt fiber. Um, yeah, that was they, they used it in their range and uh, when I was still writing for them back in 2014 and 2013. I'm not sure if they still use the basalt in the in the basalt. new ranges, but the, yeah, but the basalt fiber. Um, so we do use it in our airash boards as well. So the board that I ride's also got basalt fiber. Mm -hmm. so, nice. I, I actually laminated a board this evening with some. It's lovely to work with. Dave, you de definitely need to get your hands on some. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, talk to him over there. Um, <laughs> Excellent. So for mine are just carbon and S-class. Different weaves, you know. Uh, so you use two different weaves on one board? Is that- Two different layers, yeah. But the actual weave of the material. Uh, yeah, I use a unidirectional S-class and then a bi-directional carbon fiber. Hmm. You can get unidirectional carbon fiber and stuff too. Um, you can get pretty much any material, any weave you want. You know, it's a matter of uh, economics too. Some of this stuff's very expensive, and you don't want. You know, I mean, look at like the um, carved boards. You know, they're sixteen hundred dollars for a twin tip. I'm trying to stay away from that. 
and just make and, mine more available to regular people, you know. And then do you vacuum bag it? Is a twin tip vacuum bag? Uh, back in the day when I made them, you know, in my garage, they were. Now we uh, make a press, a cassette that's the exact shape of the board, top and bottom, an aluminum billet, and it goes into a two-ton press. Wow. And so it achieves the same result as a vacuum bag, but there's a lot less waste. Talk about environment. Uh, vacuum bagging does produce a lot of waste. Mm -hmm. um, with the press, it's uh, you just make it one time, and I've made like 6,000 boards out of that one mold without you know really any waste. And, and how much are those molds, Dave? I remember you telling me once. It's very expensive. Yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, probably about, they're probably that's about twenty thousand now for a mold. They so have, you hope uh, in the United States. They have war uh, water jackets that run through them like an internal combustion engine, so you can run hot water through it and heat the epoxy up, and that will cause it to set off in like fifteen minutes. It's only in the mold for like fifteen minutes, mm -hmm. and then before they lift it open, it's uh, they run cold water through it, so you're pulling a cold board out of the mold. Hmm. That way it can't sag or anything. Maybe if it comes out at 200 degrees, you know, and you set on the table, you might lose some rocker or something. So, wow, quite the process. Yeah, it's a, it's a, this, uh, the factory where I am, I believe they make Air Rush. Um, is that right, Dave? And um, Core. They, they, used to. They, they used to make Air Rush, yeah, not anymore. So, oh, not anymore. But we'll, ch we'll chat afterwards, Dave. <laughs> okay. there's some collaboration and relationship building right there there you go exactly <laughs> yeah, Dave's always it. been an inspiration his, That's awesome. his cutting edge techniques and he makes some cool stuff for sure very uh, cool yeah, yeah. It, it's good to meet all these legends like so I've met the, um, oh god what was the kite designer's name I'm in, in, at the kite factory I've been to, I used to try to make kites but I got out of that it was too much got out of the kites yeah but um, uh, well, I, I know Dave that um, some of our audience may have more questions, so let me just open it up. Any other questions yeah. about either you know kiteboard manufacturing and design, or why that you know certain kiteboard works for certain conditions, or even just about you know business? Some of you may be having have your own business. I know I do, and many of you do too. Or maybe thinking about starting your own business. Um, so anything around you know business, perseverance in business, or anything kiting related? Entrepreneur is the way to go for me. Right. <laughs> I tried the cubicle life for like 10 years and couldn't handle it. Same. I, I have one question, Dave. So, um, I mean, of course, both DK and I have been watching you for, for a very long time. Um, in our opinion, or from all of our reading, you were the first um, board guy to make um, kite boards using the the snowboard bases, um, which everybody pretty pretty much uses now. Is that is that correct? Yeah, as far as I know, I was the first one because I went to a snowboard factory to make mm -hmm. my first uh, factory made kite boards. And, and isn't that Dave? Isn't that that's Dave? Because because you couldn't get any other contacts. Right, because I couldn't. I was getting and shut so out. So you were being resourceful. <laughs> I was getting just, shut out and wouldn't take no for an answer. Yeah. Five factories. <laughs> and serious. so yeah, I, as far as I know, I think well, Jimmy Lewis was making custom made thin boards. You know the old pickle forks. I don't know if you guys. Those were that painted. That. Those were painted top and bottom, weren't they? Right. They were just paint. They were painted and made by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think I was the first one that adapted the thin board concepts um, to a factory setting. And then we started using the PTEX. They called it DuraSurf back then, but yeah. it's uh, ultra high molecular weight is what they call it. It's yeah. a really <laughs> dense Tupperware, basically, like a sheet of mm -hmm. dense Tupperware. And you Stick that on the bottom and it, it made them so you could ride over rocks or on the beach or parks or anything like that you know and nice. nowadays and we've we've lightened them up a little bit with something not quite as tough as that almost but it's um you know a little bit lighter so and you can do and more fancy graphics see-through windows and that sort of thing so 
Yeah, your graphics are amazing, Dave. Um, I think Joyce uh, has a question for you. Joyce, go ahead. Let me let me just unmute. This is an easier question than the one about the environment. <laughs> I'm okay. not clear. I'm not clear uh, which countries are now producing your boards. That's the first question. And connected with that is: Has your production been slowed by COVID? Have the supply chains been um, disrupted? Yes, definitely. Uh, and that's why I've, you know it would be nice to make them locally, to where I didn't have to deal with all that. But it's from from what I can find, there's just not any good factories in the U.S. here. But um, yeah, they're made in Taiwan and it has been affected they've told my lead times have gone from like six months to nine months mm -hmm. uh, to get boards and is that because of the supply chain uh of the transportation or is it because of actually there uh both. because of COVID? both, both. They're, they're having troubles getting fiberglass and mm -hmm. raw materials um into the factory and you know they have to get epoxy and fiberglass and carbon fiber sheets and and they're having trouble with that and then also they i guess the factory there didn't slow down too much i think taiwan handled it pretty well the covid crisis but i tell you what the shipping definitely slowed it down it went and, from and like what one month to like three and a half months to get and to just a uh, follow-up question what about the demand for your work for your boards for your for your stuff is the demand still strong for it at yes, this now time it's of the year about average um, ironically when uh you know we had all the lockdowns and as we were coming out of the lockdowns the demand for sporting goods went yeah. through the roof same here same my same sales thing. are crazy i ran out of everything you know but uh now you know since i've been doing this a long time i have a little bit bigger nest egg to put out to buy boards now the way it is since the lead time is so long still because the um, supply chain the trucking the shipping all that is really slow uh and the, uh hence my lead time is nine months um i have quite a lot of stock right now but I've already put in a big deposit for my next round. Yeah, same, same here. We aren't spending any money on travel, of course, uh, up to the moment. And so there's just thousands of dollars sort of floating around that would normally have been put on travel. And uh, the, the growth of every um, outdoor activity has been phenomenal, including uh, foiling and winging. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the Boiling, same winging, supply paddle model. boards, you know, yep. kayaks, anything like that. Yep. It's pretty hard to find, you know. Yep. I hope I think things are going to gradually catch back up, but I mean, I'm I'm laying myself on the line financially um, in order to keep stock. Mm -hmm. You know, by because the longer lead times, I'm I'm buying more stuff, even though I have a lot of stuff already. So hopefully, I won't run out of stock for a couple of years. <laughs> It requires a um, strong backbone to see it all through. <laughs> it really does. It's pretty scary. Stay, you know I mean? stay the course. Yeah. That, that's why Dave is the king of perseverance. That's why. <laughs> that's why I asked him to talk on uh, this topic today. It is pretty today. exciting putting out of your whole bank account looks all nice and fat, and it's all gone. <laughs> you know. The jo the joys of a small business owner. Although yeah. I don't I don't say you're so small anymore, Dave. Um, I I know one of the things that you mentioned, um, Dave, was that. Uh, as far as being resourceful is you you've come out now with some other products some bright turquoise blue uh impact vest and beanies oh, yeah. and you know i know as a as a woman kiter i'm always looking to try to find something beyond basic black uh, well, I, have looks, my right? inside, you know. <laughs> I know you do and i love that you're offering blue and you know i i, I like i told you yesterday i want to see a woman model next time in that blue right even yeah. though that guy looks pretty good um, I, I really looking. want to buy the blue vest. And, and you, you had uh, said you would be offering something uh, to our audience today. What was that? Oh, yeah. Uh, anybody that listened, you can get 10% off uh, on anything that I sell if you want. Oh, good. So anybody like here, next here, week, I think. Okay. So anybody here today, if you need any new product, whether it's a board, a beanie, or a vest, um, just reach out to Lightwave Dave on uh, Facebook and uh, he'll give you 10% off his products. So that's very nice. Appreciate that, Dave. Yeah, sure.
That's a very uh, nice offer. I might have to replace that board I sold to the new. <laughs> yeah, the with new the new um, unidirectional S class model we're using there, they're nicer now. Which one did you have? We had, man, it was, what was the wing? It was a big one, but it was old. I think my boyfriend had it for years. Yeah, I, it was blue and green. Mm -hmm. So I don't, it had to be at least five years old, maybe longer. Oh, it looked like a bamboo on it? Yeah, uh, no, no, it was before that, I think even. Before that one? Here's the new beanie. Like mm -hmm. it. Neoprene, keep your noggin warm. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Dave. I'm definitely getting mine. I, I think I already ordered them from you yesterday. I right? sent it yesterday. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll make sure and get, I always you, get my orders get you covered on that. Yeah, and I know uh, Jennifer just posted a really cool, everybody just pull up in their chat window if you haven't already. She just put a picture. Is this an original light wave design? Look at those Hawaiian flowers. Where? It's uh, in the chat window. It's a JPEG. That, I think uh, you have to click on it. Yeah, double click on it to open it in on your own computer. Uh, I'll see if I can share Jennifer, my screen. Hold on, I'm gonna share my screen. Here we go, do you see it now? Oh, wow, that's a handmade one. Wow, yeah, that's one of my originals. How cool is that? So that was like the first year I was hand making boards in the garage. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, uh, thanks for sharing that, Jennifer. You can, <laughs> you can see the Hawaiian influence there, you know? I was going to visit Jimmy Lewis a lot. He taught me a lot. Well, that's where I got that picture is off of his shop wall. Oh, you did? Okay, <laughs> yeah. cool. Jimmy Lewis is my mentor for sure. Oh, that's so awesome. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. So I want to thank you, Dave, that's for, cool. Thanks, for spending this time with us today to talk about perseverance and your, your own experience with your business for 24 years in such a competitive um, kite uh, industry. You've, you've really hit the nail on the head. And I, and I know there's a lot of people who appreciate your designs like Jill and I were talking about. And it, it really helps a lot of new kiters get going and get hooked on kiting. And then beyond that, when you become a more intermediate to advanced kiter, there's also other board options to help you succeed as well. Well, I so love what I do. I'm lucky. I, I, I can see you love it and you're a cool guy and, and you obviously are a good businessman. And I appreciate the light wind tips you gave us too. And I put a video from uh, Dave's site, his website uh, there, if you'd like to see it. He gave me great tips in kiting in light wind and, and uh, we're sharing that with you as well. Um, and so for our last uh, moments together, it's just an open forum. Uh, ladies, this is also for us to connect with each other, not only to you know, learn about kiting tips or locations or you know, keeping a, a positive mindset, but it, it's just to support and connect with one another. Um, so I'm going to ask you all just to, if you're on the chat window on the on the internet version, if you're not just calling in and you can see the screen, go ahead and go down to the chat window um, and just type in the chat window, um, what is one thing that you have done or need to do um, to, to show your perseverance? And that could be either in relationships, flexibility, or resourcefulness, because Dave talked about those three things, or, or however you define perseverance. What's one thing you've either done lately that you're proud of? You persevered through something really challenging, like Dave did in his business for this long and succeeded. Um, or what's one thing you need to do still to persevere through a difficult time? And you know we're in difficult times right now. So um, I'm going to ask you to just throw that in the chat window. And we can certainly uh, talk briefly about it before we all go. Uh, Dave says, wake up and kite, even when it's cold. <laughs> That's yeah. Hard to do. yeah, Christy. Mm -hmm. Christy, where are you calling from? Christy says adaptability. Hi, sorry, um, I had to find that unmute button. <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually from the Bay Area as well. I'm a little island called Alameda. Oh, oh nice. nice yeah I so actually i learned to kite in uh, la ventana in late january um the prior year i spent just using the trainer kite the three uh, meter and then i took a trip and went to la ventana and i'm up and riding and now i'm all geared up and i have a 148 but i just bought a lightweight dave 144 um okay. board. Oh, well so done. yeah <laughs> So I'm excited. I, I think that's, uh, it, does that sound about the right size? I'm 5'8", 
I'm five, eight and a half actually, I'm pretty tall. So um, yeah, I'm, I was successful with that 148 in La Ventana. I got up pretty quick. So I think, um, I think I'll try with that first and then hopefully right move on. very quickly. Well, there's the a lot of lightwave supporters in Alameda. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure I, you know, I love Alameda. So I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, you can try different boards of mine there too. A lot of people have them there. Yeah, it's that you have a, a really good reputation here. So thank you. Uh, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm just over in Sacramento. So I'm close by. Anytime you guys want, you know, are going out riding, I'll come ride with you. That's Very cool. cool. Oh, that's cool. Thanks for sharing, Christy. Um, and nice to meet you. Um, and Gabby, you mentioned dealing with back pain. That, that can't be any fun, whether you're kiting or not. Yeah. Who are you calling from, Gabby? Um, I'm calling from the UK. I'm currently cooking some dinner. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I've had some sciatica for a long time and I bought a heat, a heat harness. Um, and actually, that's been a lot better for me. Um, and it's just about kind of strengthening my core as well because I found that quite tough. But kiting in light wind is challenging, so I really appreciate some of the tips tonight. No problem. Nice. Where do you kite in the UK? South Coast? Um, so we have a very muddy spot called um, West. Uh, well, we've got Westwood Ho, which is lovely, but um, Western <laughs> Supermare. I live in Bristol, so. Oh yeah, Western Supermare. I've been there. That's the, uh, oh. that's the B and B capital. Yeah, so uh, it's I've been there. Muddy. Nice. Yeah, it's a really <laughs> low tide, <laughs> flat. Like it's good for buggying, right? Yeah, yeah, good for buggying, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we but we get away to Europe a lot, so we've got um, Turkey, Greece, and uh, the Canary Islands booked this year because oh, we're going nice. for days. Because of course, wow. we just that's there. awesome. <laughs> wow, well, Gabby, I want to be your friend and travel with you. Come to Europe and try it. <laughs> it's really cool. It's so good. good to meet you. Thanks for sharing. And um, right. Gabby, just so you know, Laurel has uh, just put in the chat window, uh, we have an article actually on our um, Women's Collective Facebook page, or actually on our website, um, that is just about that, about the back pain and, and dealing with oh, that. Amazing. And Thank you. So there's yeah. a link there if you, uh, if you care to click on that. Oh, it's amazing. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and, and Joyce, um, <laughs> you're wanting to persevere in winging, right? And uh, finding your winging buddies. I am. That's been it's been the best part of it all. Starting something new, you know, being being like you intermediate kiter and then switching over to winging where it's all face plants again. But to have those women <laughs> buddies and, you know, to, to be able to <laughs> urge each other on and tell each other that the sharks are not a problem, not a problem, <laughs> even though everybody's seen them. It's OK. It's going to be OK. And right. go again the next day, it's just it's been such oh. an essential part of it. The, and I'm these women are such wonderful, strong I, women I'm as well. It's great. So and proud we, of you. Yeah, we're at, you know, there's always somebody at your stage of learning, yes. which is fantastic. Yes, yes, I agree. And empathy wow. goes a long way. And yeah. sport and swallowing yeah. your pride, huh? Empathy and swallowing your pride. Yeah, and enjoy. I had to, I, Ahead, I was laughing hilariously because Gabby was talking about she was going to go here, she was going to go there, she was going to go here, she was going to go there. We're talking like ten thousand dollars out of New Zealand to do all that. I'm oh, going no. to the North Beaches, the East Beaches, the West Beaches. But Joyce, and I don't already, have a hundred people. You're already in paradise in New Zealand. Exactly. You don't need to go anywhere. <laughs> exactly. That's and, what and, I tell myself. And Joyce, but I'd love like to have those adventures for sure. They sound like wonderful adventures. Yeah. What'd you say, Gabby? It was it was really cheap. We got it on a sale, so one of the flights was like thirty pounds. Oh, it's unbelievable! Wow. That's oh, because... Sorry, I'm <laughs> That's... Yeah, oh, no, no, I'm gonna I'm no gonna stay in that trip. Well, I will. I know, and I'll I know, come to the UK. Um, I know Joyce. The whole winging thing. Francis was so gracious last time to give us a lot of really great tips great. on winging and and wing foiling. And that Francis, that was such a great. Um, conversation with you. I mean, I, you gave me confidence to go out and try it, and even some tips on how to do it well as a newbie and not not face plant so much. So I really appreciate that. And um, and for me, um, 
heading in Colombia with Francis in a, in a week or so is in, in waves. It's going to be quite the interesting um, thing I need to persevere through. Um, it's a Cabrino trip we're both going on. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. And then Jill, uh, what did you say here, Jill? Let's see. Need to launch and land on your own. That's what you need help with and want to persevere. Yeah. And you're kiting where Laurel's team teaches. Oh, that's awesome. So you're uh, in the Dominican sometimes. Mostly. Right? That's most. I mean, I've kited a lot of other places. I was just in Baja actually a, a week or so ago, but most of my kiting is done there. So there's, you know, there's always someone there, but there's not always someone to help you. Yeah. I agree. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. And um, I mean, I can chime in um, with what I've done please. in the beach there in Cabarete, which is, um, you know, and maybe it's because I uh, did train as an instructor, um, but I can just teach a, um, a, a beach walker to just grab my kite for me, you know, to just say like, hey, hold the kite. Don't let go until I give you the thumbs up. And then I'm confident in knowing that I can set up the launching um, angle and get into position without, you know, pushing them over by walking from downwind to upwind, making that the kite goes from flapping to not flapping, seeing that it's okay, just giving them a thumbs up. Normally they're really excited, you know, even if they're, you don't have never done it before. And then the same goes with landing, just coming into the beach, which normally I don't do. Normally I stay in the water, bring my kite low, have the guys on the beach land it, and then I walk out of the water with a kite already landed. But in this case, if there's nobody there, kite to the beach, stand there, find, like go to someone and just be like, hey, again, I'm just gonna lower this down. See that big tube? If you can grab it and just hold on to it, don't let go. Mm -hmm. And I've had really good success with that. So could be worth great. trying. That's great. You Those guys are great have a tips. Pretty narrow beach, right, Laurel? Well, yeah, and especially where like where Jill is, um, which is in between the Kite Beach and in between where my school in Cabarete is, it is a little bit narrow. There are rocks, um, and so it's not exactly. And it's and different times of year, it's big or small. Like, yes. and I and I do have a I have a cord that I hook to the the staircase, so if no one's there, I can I do that's like my preferred method if I'm by myself. Um, but sometimes when I do that sunset, you know, that's, I love that sunset session. All the instructors are gone. Everybody's gone. I'm out there kind of mostly by myself and it, it's, you know, that beach gets kind of quiet. So, but mm -hmm. I, I didn't think of kind of asking a, you know, usually there's, so, I mean, there's someone on our property and someone will run down and grab it, but every once in a while, I would just feel so much better. Sometimes I'm standing there like, okay. Anybody coming? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, in that case, Jill, just, you know, keep kiting until you see someone walking on the beach who looks like they're physically <laughs> capable <laughs> of holding your kite. And then, you know, with, with you and your, you know, sweet um, face and smile, they're just going to be like, yes, I will help you, whatever it is. So that's awesome. Thanks for those tips, Laurel. And, and I don't think I would have thought about that just a beach goer, you know, and, and, and having to be very clear about how simple this is, and, and I'm going to do this, and you're going to do that. And, you know, if you're desperate, I think that's a great tip. Um, and it's also um, relatively safe. If you have good kite control, you feel confident and the wind is steady. Yes. You, you know, go. if it's gusty, then different story. Let's, I'll bet you know. you're off. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and I've just learned a drift launch and I know you can't always do that. And, you know, high wind or wave or, you know, et cetera. But, but that's a, that's a, just a lifesaver being able to drift launch myself when no one's around. Um, so Jill, so have, go ahead. Can I say, uh, Jill, you were saying you have a loop on the, on the beach or something? Like a tether? Well, I, yeah. So, so I take a chicken loop to off? the, right. So then I can put the, the kite on the edge and then run over and hook it up and then launch it. And that, that works. Um, and I've done that to, more to land than than to launch and I, and actually that works and usually the wind direction there works for that so yeah. and i you know from everything that i've read that's they the experts say that's one of the safer ways when you're learning to mm -hmm. to land your own kite is to do that so if the beach is big enough that works that's it's that question that. of sometimes our beach isn't big enough to do that mm -hmm. and i have to land it in towards the shore instead of away from the shore because i'll be landing it you know, in the water and there's a little, sometimes even there's a little shore break. And so that wouldn't work, but so that, so I've used that method, you know, yeah. tying it to something. Yeah. I like mm -hmm. that method too. I have a real large area where I normally kite, but yeah, that's what we do. 
put awesome. a carabiner and a webbing around a parking pole. Yeah. And hook your chicken loop onto it. And yeah, go launch your own kite. Kind of, yeah. Awesome. Great discussion. Um, so I just want to check in and make sure I didn't leave anybody out. Uh, Margaret, Francis, any last thoughts on just how you want to be persevering through this next month or year? You know, what are some big things that you're tackling? Well, I'm going to do this real quick without a meeting in a minute. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I want to heal from injury. I've had a yes. strained muscle for the past eight months in which I'm going to physical therapy finally. So yes. every time I'm kiting and I'm winging, I'm re-injuring it. Um, get free of injuries so I can uh, progress quicker. Nice. Good luck with all that. Happy healing. How about for you, you Margaret? Soon. I'll see you soon. God bless, Francis. You're my hero. <laughs> you are my hero. Margaret, any last thoughts from you? Oh, I'm just looking forward to the end of COVID and getting back to traveling like we normally would have in this area. Same. A lot of our restrictions have just come off in the last couple of days. And um, it's great to see that my business is is much like Dave, I export to over 20 countries. Wow. Um, so it's great that the world has finally kind of opened up again. And we've had an incredibly busy December, January, February, March. So our, well, I guess we just started March, but yeah. Awesome. Well, and I want to persevere through my new song release, which is released today. I'm so exciting. I, I, I can't even hardly help it. Um, I help myself. I'm just, um, I've just wrote and produced a new song. It's released today on all the major um, music streaming channels. It's called Perpetual Condition. And it's about the world we find ourselves in right now. Perpetual Condition by Holly Peck. So search it for Spotify, iTunes, any of those. And for every download I get today, I'm donating and matching um, that amount to Ukraine for their Red Cross for recovery efforts. Right. So that's what I'm working through. Thank you everyone for being here today from all Thanks, over the Holly. globe. It was so nice to see you and Dave, so grateful for you sharing your story and some inspiration. Thank nice you. Let's to meet you give him nice a to meet hand. you guys and see some old faces too. Oh yeah, we hope to see you all around the globe soon. Kiting. Thanks everybody. Thank, yeah, thank you. you. We'll see you next thank month. you, Dave. So good to see you guys. Bye, Bye ladies, so thank you for nice having me here. on. Thank Bye. you. So fun to have you. Bye. Bye, Dave. Thank you. Bye.